Full disclosure, I don't blindly consider Martin Scorsese as the unequivocal greatest living director. I acknowledge he's a master and one of the greats, so please be gentle with me in the comment section as I give you my honest assessment in this spoiler-free review of the acclaimed director's three and a half hour epic, Killers of the Flower Moon. But first, I just started this channel this summer and I built a small following and I'm having a blast. And you can help it grow by liking this video, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell so you never miss any of my future reviews. Ernest returns home from World War I and settles with his uncle in Oklahoma where the Osage Native Americans have found fortune in their oil-rich land. In the early 20s, murders of members of the Osage tribe begin to mount, but no investigations take place. At this point, Ernest develops a relationship with Molly, a full-blood Osage Indian. With this union, he's expected to become a very rich man, but he will also have a front seat to a very dark period in American history filled with mystery and misery. With acclaimed director Martin Scorsese at the helm and heavy-hitting actors like Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro starring in Killers of the Flower Moon, it's no surprise that this is one of the most highly anticipated films of the year. But even with that star power, the true star of the film is Lily Gladstone and her portrayal of the tragic character Molly Burkhart, a full-blood Osage Native American. When she appears on screen, her presence immediately requires you to pay attention to each glance, each subtle grin, and each sorrow that exists behind her stoic facade. Shomikasi. That's how you are. I don't know what you said, but it must have been Indian for handsome devil. <laughs> <laughs> Here lies a major problem with this film. As the story unfolds, certain plot points minimize Molly's time on screen and reduces her to a background character. We begin to watch her story from the perspective of Ernest, Leonardo DiCaprio, and his uncle William, Robert De Niro, whose understated performance may be the most overlooked aspect of the film. His ability to become menacing while offering a prayer of peace and blessing is both subtle and frankly difficult for me to grasp. In the hands of any other actor, this dichotomy could come across as disingenuous or even goofy, but De Niro reminds us again that he's one of the greatest actors of all time. Meanwhile, Leonardo DiCaprio gives a much less subtle performance as Ernest, a weak man whose longing for comfort money can bring supersedes his loyalty to family and friends. Along with his bad haircut and rotting teeth, DiCaprio transforms into this pathetic excuse of a man by distorting his mouth with a constant grimace. It's amazing how such a small exaggeration can so successfully hypnotize you into forgetting the actor and seeing only the character. I will say though, as successful as this technique is for the majority of the movie, there is a portion of the film where DiCaprio exaggerates this feature so much that he goes full Billy Bob Thornton as Sling Blade. I reckon I'll help me some of the bacon. As good as these performances are, I still found myself longing for more Lily Gladstone and the small shimmer of light that she brings to an otherwise miserable story. And this story is miserable. That's another problem I have with Killers of the Flower Moon. Not that it's miserable, I like miserable movies, but it's the method in which Scorsese evokes this misery. Yes, if you show a mother crying over the dead corpse of her child, it makes me miserable. But to me, this feels manipulative. The same way a Sarah McLaughlin Save the Dog commercial makes me miserable. And this film is filled with constant misery, but I think it's a delicate difference. I'm not feeling the misery of the characters because I'm so invested in their well-being. I'm simply feeling misery because Scorsese literally keeps showing me instances and images that make me feel miserable. I would describe this approach more as a shout than a whisper. Scorsese's signature pace and energy is very evident in the first hour of Killers of the Flower Moon, but after we're introduced to the characters and the horrors of the mysterious murders are established, the tone changes. It begins to feel like he's paying homage to other films and filmmakers, and the style and tone begin to feel uneven and rudderless. At times, it feels like The Godfather 1 and 2, with large celebrations juxtaposed with intimate conversations. Unfortunately, rather than developing countless characters and furthering a complex plot, these grandiose scenes achieve little other than establishing the time and tone and looking really cool. 
At other times, it feels like the untouchables, with the vintage automobiles, suits, and the infancy of the FBI. There's one specific scene where Robert De Niro is getting a shave at the barbershop that felt exactly like his shaving scene as Al Capone in The Untouchables, with an overhead perspective and everything. I feel like it had to be an inside joke, and I really expected the barber to nick his skin, but alas, it never happened. Much of the directing simply depends on establishing shots, then shot reverse shot of long conversations. Now, there's nothing wrong with this simplistic style. Again, it felt at times like Francis Ford Coppola, but in his films, he would move the characters, allowing their bodies to be a part of the performance, allowing us to see other characters, and establishing dominance within a simple scene. In Flower Moon, it seems like the actors are handcuffed by these stationary close-ups and reverse angles. Even Jesse Plemons, who I love, his role as an investigator feels limited to nothing but mid-shot conversations. This movie is nearly three and a half hours, but I'll admit, the long runtime didn't bother me. I just love watching movies so much in the theater. However, for that length of time, I would have loved to learn more about the Osage culture, like Scorsese did so well with the 17th century Japanese culture in silence. Educate me, entertain me. I want something to obsess about in the days after I watch the movie. And Killers of the Flower Moon just didn't do that for me. I'll admit, my impression of the movie has improved over the last few days since my initial reaction. And I think most of that is due to Robert De Niro's performance. I just keep thinking about how he managed to be ominous while being so kind. And I think it's because De Niro's character wasn't acting nice on the surface while knowing he was evil on the inside. I think his character truly believed he was good. And the one thing scarier than an evil dude pretending to be nice is an evil dude that truly believes he's good. That's scary. Killers of the Flower Moon is violent, well acted, and an enjoyable experience at the movies. It will probably be an Oscars darling, but it didn't have a serious impact on me, which I don't expect of every director, but I do expect it from the greatest living director. So, after all that, I guess my opinion of Martin Scorsese really hasn't changed. What do you guys think? Is he undoubtedly the greatest living director? If not, who do you think is?